Hi, welcome to our class Digital Geometry Processing where I will be your instructor Yusuf Sahinoğlu uh, So this course uh, will uh, give you two programming assignments to complete as well as a term project and we will follow it with the final exam uh, the course slides and videos will be sufficient, but if you want a reference book, you can follow this Polygon Mesh Processing book. Uh, also, this sampler of useful tools book that can be found online. Uh, C++ programming is required. Uh, but as far as the 3D viewer, that stuff, uh, computer graphics related stuff, I will provide you a user interface. Uh, API based on Open Invent Inventor library, um, so don't worry about that. But still, you have to know C++ very well. There are similar courses around. Uh, okay, so let, let's do the course actually. Our objective of this course is to uh, get you familiar with the geometry pro geometry processing pipeline, which begins by capturing data or designing. The data yourself uh, and once you have the data you can reconstruct the surface around it analyze the data simulate some situation based on the data and in the end you can render your output to the screen or uh, through your 3d printer to the physical world uh, so let me just introduce you this uh, surface mesh quickly because this is something we will deal with all uh, a lot during this course uh, typically geometry data comes through this mesh structure where the first part with the V's are the geometric data and literally geometric data followed by the topological data where you connect these points you are already familiar with this thing I believe and this is the most simplest uh, surface you can come up with you can with that tactic you can uh, model any surface through a mesh and we will study these meshes a lot uh, let me come back to the objective uh, so creation of those meshes from a given point cloud raw data so 3d scanning technologies uh, like the active methods provide you this 3d point data then I have this task of reconstructing the surface, fitting it. Or passive methods like the existing images can also provide me this 3D point cloud data. Again, reconstruction is needed and we will deal with it. Analysis of 3D structures in the form of point clouds or meshes. Let's stick with meshes. Uh, it is useful to relate models to each other. Uh, Manipulate, edit existing data, uh, map the three dimensional data to 2D in the uh, topic of parametrization, visualization of information like here is an information in the form of a matrix depicting geodesic distances between some 3D points, and I can visualize them clearly in an Euclidean embedding. Remeshing, so here this is a mesh, this is also a mesh, but the one below is more preferable in finite element applications due to nice triangulations, nice triangles around, so remeshing, we will see that. Registration, uh, so this is related to obtaining this 3D point cloud data, um, a scanning from a one particular viewpoint will give you only some subset of the whole data like this bunny the back is missing so you scan it again from the back but in the end you have to merge all of them into one registered model you will see that and finally 3d printing is of interest where we do this layer by layer production this is not just mechanical issue there are many algorithms uh, like deciding the layers here or not even about printing like making the objects stand after the printing action or <clears throat> finding the 
most breakable points, vulnerable points. So there are many research topics regarding digital geometry processing here. And you need to uh, distinguish this class, uh, digital geometry class, from a regular computer graphics class because we don't really deal with the graphics material like rendering, either <coughs> forward rendering, rasterization, or backward rendering, ray tracing. <clears throat> so we are not going to try to get these fancy images. We are not going to deal with <clears throat> transformations, transformation matrices. Uh, we will see deformations, like in the transformation, one particular matrix is applied to all data points and you have this global rigid motion. We will also see that in aligning 3D point clouds, but still uh, we will see more than just rigid transformations. We will learn deformations. And this rather complex picture is, so I can summarize the parts that are of interest to us, which is what a uh, geometric model, okay, uh, so from a data, like the this data I mentioned before. Uh, coming to a geometric model is the task of, is our task, digital geometry processing. Once you have the model, you can use computer graphics to rasterize it or to ray trace it to a 2D image plane. And the backward is from a given image, you can use computer vision to get the data, <clears throat> like uh, uh, shape from silhouette approaches give you the 3D data and then you can go to the geometric model. So there are good uh, connections between these fields. And this is the uh, probably the first example I know at least regarding geometry from ancient times we want to measure the height of a mountain and we don't have those fancy LiDAR devices around so we have this slave we want him to walk a lot of miles from his, his location to the beginning of this mountain and then he comes back he also walks towards this tree and then he bends over until he sees the top of this mountain which gives us this little triangle and big triangle and using triangle similarity, he can find the height of the mountain. In modern times, we still have geometry, like linear, piecewise, little triangle meshes make up geometries. Uh, and geometric models <coughs> are everywhere because they are easy to manipulate, easy to repair, easy to compare, easy to create, uh, and easy to simulate. So. In this environment, for instance, everything before this physical construction has actually taken place in a digital environment with uh, geometric models. Uh, so we digitally model this stadium or this ship or this building uh, and repair or manipulate that model and after some serious amount of uh, simulation we fix, come back to the model, fix, simulate, come back, fix, come back, and in the very end we do the implementation. Okay, so initially we have an idea obviously. So digital models are common and very useful, uh, not just in uh, physical production, sometimes they stay entirely in digital domain, but still they are fun, like they uh, they are used in our video games that keep us in front of computer uh, or in 3D entertainment, cinema. <clears throat> in medical image analysis we can see our insight using some visualization of scalar fields by getting that uh, models from medical data. Uh, you can, a surgeon can show the predicted outcome of your nose operation before the operation to prevent you at least in this case from the operation uh, 
yes, so other fields use digital models, robotics use it, like if you want to instruct your robot to get this uh, glass from this coffee table, that robot only has sensors and given the sensor data you need to, to manipulate that digital data to make him mm, get the instruction. Uh, valuable and old cultural heritage can be digitized. Geological data can be digitized and analyzed. New 3D content can be created based on existing 3D content. Again, using some dig digital geometry processing, we can uh, relate them to each other by finding correspondences and then using the correspondences we can interpolate the in-between new frames. <clears throat> 3D printing, uh, there are many problems as I briefly mentioned, so use the least amount of material to get the strongest production possible, for instance. Mm, and in the end, the end game will be a toy or something, a gift to your girlfriend, but still mm, uh, there is serious research going on here. Uh, augmented reality AR lets you mm, put 3D or 2D digital content on top of your video, for instance in the virtual shopping application, or the VR will put you into that virtual environment, which is uh, populated with digital models. And also you can simulate stuff before production from ergonomic point of view, for instance. Yeah, so this is why we deal with digital models a lot. And in this course, unlike the computer graphics course where you are just interested in, mostly just interested in the rendering of stuff and maybe rigid motion of stuff, here in this course we will actually see the creation of those stuff. Okay, how to get those uh, digital models in the first place. Uh, and also to analyze and to compare that stuff, to edit that stuff. Uh, so, okay. Uh, uh, so this is an active method of geometry capture, geometric data capture. You actively send rays to the victim, to the target, it can be laser beam, it can be infrared structured patterns, uh, but in the end you will get the 3D data point by using some time of flight values, etc. Or you can also use some vibrations in this medical MRI machine, for instance, to get the 3D data. Uh, if you have a dynamic uh, actor, actress, then sending laser beams is not so feasible. You probably capture the video and then you process that video passively, so this is a passive method, uh, because you don't hit the target explicitly at that time. You use the existing video samples to create the 3D back. Or if you are in a motion capture environment, uh, you can trace the spheres uh, attached to the body of the actor to get the 3D locations of those spheres. Uh, so this will give you 3D point cloud, this will give you 3D point cloud, uh, but sometimes we want the surface as well. So you can create the surface from the 3D point cloud of this input, but also you can just create it directly using some uh, semi-automatic or fully automatic methods. Like even with the recent development of deep learning technology, given just a 2D stick figure, you are able to uh, put the corresponding 3D, uh, create the corresponding 3D figure whose projection will match with this. To the uh, stick figure, basically. Okay, so uh, let's represent geometric data 
uh, mostly we use 2D surface embedded in 3D like in all these pictures here uh, and this is a common way to go because uh, first of all to render this cow you don't really need any inside information the outer thin shell surface is enough and you can get that representation by using a set of polygons attached to each other uh, and this polygon is triangle here, it is quad here, it is pentagon here, so it can be anything. But in addition to this very popular approach of uh, surface mesh, surface meshes, we can just use the point cloud or we can use tetrahedral mesh. So this is not good for rendering, but obviously it is good for some simulation purposes as it's more realistic. After all, we also have some insight inside our body. You can use spherical representation, you can use just the skeleton of the data, it still gives you available information, or you can represent the uh, model as a uh, in a grid using these function values on this grid, and then if you really want to get the uh, surface mesh of this model, then you can use some Martian cubes like algorithms to extract it. Uh, the polygon meshes, the first row here, is the most popular one and we will stick with that mostly in this class. Uh, as I mentioned, it is good for rendering because only the outside is visible anyway. We can refine it, we can compare other polygon meshes we can create new ones based on the existing ones, we can segment it or other stuff. Um, however, for a deformation application, for instance, uh, only the shell modeling, the polygon surface modeling, may not be sufficient. You may you lose some data. Here, for instance, in this execution, I am using a tetrahedral mesh with the same algorithm, so this is better. But I should again mention that uh, there are nice developments in this field that also allows you to do very nice deformations with the polygon surface models as well. Okay, so this is from an old algorithm, but still it gives you an idea. <clears throat> so polygon mesh is a piecewise linear surface representation. So take this analogy from calculus, we have this space, I can represent this piece using this parabola x square and this space using this constant function 6 and this is using this uh, linear function with that tactic I have I can represent this model piece by piece using little lines in 2d or so this is different uh, here you can represent this uh, model uh, using uh, mathematical parametrization as we know this model uh, as a mathematical formula it's a circle but in general we uh, are able to represent any surface piece by piece where the pieces are lines here in 2d so here the surface or the curve is the circle and I use three pieces, one, two, three, and this dash line is the error, so it is not that good, but if I increase the uh, number of pieces, then I will get a very good approximation. And in 3D, my piece will be 2D, okay, so it is one dimension less. In 3D, I want to represent the sphere, and the piece will be the triangle, and this is a very rough representation of a sphere. As I subdivide it, I can get a better representation. Uh, and the error, approximation error is quadratic, meaning that if I double the number of pieces, the approximation error gets to one-fourth, not half. Uh, and the polygon meshes, to be more precise, they are C0 piecewise linear surface representation. So in this definition, I don't talk about the continuity rule. 
So by default they are C0, meaning that we just attach them without any smoothness constraints, okay? But there is no hole, so they are completely covering the uh, surface. So on the position continuity, I mean. We can also do C1 tangent continuity where this normal of the surface also varies smoothly. So in this case, it varies suddenly from this up direction. It immediately goes to this uh, other direction towards the screen. But here it goes there gradually and in C2, three, C2 continuity we also have this curvature continuity where it also uh, rounds up your cor corners. Uh, and manifold, so polygon meshes, we generally want them to be manifold. What is a manifold? Uh, so this is something about keeping things simple. Just go to the image processing. Okay, for a second. We know that every pixel has four neighbors. Okay, left, right, top, down. Uh, so this regularity makes a lot of things easier to implement and to develop, like the convolution, all the all those uh, machine learning stuff based on CNNs, etc. Uh, they are easy to implement and they are easy to understand and develop because of that regularity. So we want that kind of regularity in our meshes, okay, in our uh, polygon meshes. So what is that? Assume that meshes are manifold. So it keeps formula simple and leads to fewer special cases in codes. Okay, so what is that regularity? Every edge, take this edge, is incident to two triangles. Okay, um, so edges are contained in at most two polygonal faces. At most, because sometimes if you are at a boundary, so this edge is incident, incident to only one face, which is fine. But this edge is incident to two faces, which is also fine. However, this edge is incident to three. One, two, and three is like perpendicular to these two. So it is not acceptable more than two. Also, given any vertex, uh, its environment looks like a disk. Okay, here it's a full disk, but again, it can also be a if this is a boundary thing, so don't see these two triangles here, then for this vertex, I have this half circle, okay, which is also fine. However, this is not fine, because I am missing stuff from weird locations. This is not a half disk. Similarly, this is not fine. Okay, so this is the definition of manifoldness, and watertight mesh is a manifold mesh without the boundary edges, okay? So every edge is instant to exactly two faces, not one. Uh, and two manifold means I am <clears throat> using 2D, uh, two-dimensional pieces, like 2D triangles in 3D, okay? And so watertight meshes are very useful in simulations. They are mostly mandatory and also in 3D printing meaning that there is no hole because there is no boundary and there is no non-manifoldness going on around like this or this weird situations uh, and we can use Euler's formula on that I will show some examples and the watertight definition can roughly be uh, made like this imagine so what does it have to do with water anyway? Imagine filling the inside of this mesh with water. If nothing leaks out, then you are very likely to have a watertight mesh. Uh, so it can be single component or multiple components. Again, this is too manifold. It is manifold because take any vertex. It is uh, the environment of this looks like a disk and take any edge, it has at most two triangles touching it. Since this is closed, it is always two here. Here it is not closed because 
there is a boundary but it is still fine still a manifold still 2d because 2 manifold because 2d triangles are the linear pieces and this is still manifold but this edge is instead to only one face which is fine and by the way you don't really have to have triangles as your polygons you can use hybrid of triangles and quads like here or all quads or all pentagons whatever uh, to get your two manifold and the most common piece in my manifold will be triangle uh, quad is also popular uh, so basically a set of triangles embedded in 3d or 2d like here are that are connected by their common edges or corners okay so this is the definition of a triangle mesh triangles are useful and because if you have a function value on the triangle vertices then you can interpolate it to anywhere inside using the body centric coordinates like this can be color values or other function values uh, so it will be very useful in shape analysis not only in rendering uh, and a triangle mesh uh, this guy this is a, an example of a triangle mesh it is basically an undirected graph that we are familiar with set of vertices and edges but plus I also maintain faces for rendering purposes or for other analysis purposes I also need faces so in this case ABE is one of the faces I am dealing with and it is if they are all triangle then I have a triangle mesh a degree of a vertex will be the number of edges touching it in this case degree of A is 4 and B is 3 a mesh is K regular if all the degrees are K so this is not K regular and uh, this mesh is connected if every pair of vertices are connected okay there is no exception and let's uh, connect this triangle mesh to more graph theory to enable our Euler's formula and etc okay it helps for mesh statistics so a triangle mesh is basically an undirected graph we have so far agreed on that okay uh, but it is a special one so it is the one where it is called straight line plane graph so what is that to know the plane graph let me first introduce you the planar graph so it is a graph where every edge can be drawn to 2d without any intersection so this is planar but I didn't draw it nicely because uh, as I see some intersections here in 2d but if you are careful like if you stretch this a little bit into this form you can really draw the same uh, topology uh, without an intersection as in here and that drawing is called plane graph if the graph satisfies that no intersection property it is called planar graph I don't care about its current drawing if I care about the current drawing it is called plane graph and by the way in this drawing I am using a polyline or I can also use a curve anything it is still plane graph but if I strictly use straight lines for all the connections then it's called the straight line plane graph which is the triangle mesh that we will deal with and each face is going to be triangle so this is also known as a triangulation now uh, if I have this uh, planar graph a connected one then I have this probably the most elegant formula in math uh, at my disposal number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces is 2 let's just run this on this very basic uh, planar graph uh, by the way all the triangle meshes are a triangle mesh is a planar triangulation embedded in 3d so uh, if you draw carefully they no edge will intersect each other okay actually I think I have a 
visualization on that so you can draw this cube into 2D as you can see it can unfold like this without any intersection anyway so all the shapes starting from the most basic cube as you subdivide it further and further you can go to this shape still the same topology wise they are the same they are all planar so number of vertices minus edges plus faces is 2 is here 8 vertices 12 edges and 6 faces of a dice I have 2 and for this generic shape I still have 2 so let's first prove this real quick uh, take a planar graph uh, with two vertices and one edge and the face here is the infinite face around it so 2 minus 1 plus 1 is 2 it is holding nice now for the inductive step take another planar graph like for which the hypothesis holds and add one edge on it okay I am inducting on edges so in this case what happens is uh, the number of faces has increased one by one because here it is one where am I it is one plus the infinite phase two here it is one two and three the infinite phase is the third one but in general it is basically increasing by one okay so f plus one and number of edges obviously is increasing by one I am adding that edge literally so e plus one so what happens in this scenario is I still end up with the number 2 because and also number of verses hasn't changed at all because I have just added this edge no new black dot around so V minus E plus 1 plus F plus 1 will still be 2 because I can safely use the previous V minus E plus F holding for this subgraph here uh, and then minus 1 will cancel plus 1 and this will also lead to number 2 as expected so let's drive some statistics using uh, this formula then now that we proved it uh, so let's observe the following assume I am dealing with a triangle mesh so every face counts 3 edges ok so if I count all the faces I will have this 3 times f value as the number of edges but no weight uh, this edge is counted twice once due to this and once due to this so this number is actually over counting it is counting 2e not just e and from here I can use 2e over 3 instead of f in my formula and by the way instead of using 2 I will just use 0 here negligible because when v is very big like 3000 2 is negligible okay and hence I can proceed so this gives me a relationship between e and v like e is 3 times v and even more useful and more common uh, relationship is this doubling effect f is double the size of v and again it's a simple just plug this equation which equation uh, for number of edges it is 3f over 2 okay and under our Euler formula I keep others the same v minus number of edges plus f equal to 0 from here I can get f equal to 2v roughly because of this negligibility uh, and if you look at here it is roughly twice not exactly and average degree of a vertex is 6 so I have 4000 vertices here and notice that meshes are very sparse structures so normally I will choose all pairs so 4000 choose 2 which is a number like 8 million or something uh, but this number is not 8 million it is like 10,000 because I am for every vertex it is just connected to about six guys around it so this vertex isn't connected to something here it is connected here by a path but it is not directly connected with a single edge okay so then what is the degree what is the number of edges emanating from 
a given vertex it is 6 why it is 6 let me count all the degrees so okay all the degrees uh, so let's get, use this example so degree of this vertex is 1 2 3 right so when I count this degree I count this edge however when I count this degree I count this edge again so because every edge has two endpoints so this count will give you two twice the number of edges and to get the average I will divide this by v so 2e was 6v as found here so average degree is roughly 6 okay so Euler formula this part is already enough for us because this mesh statistics is useful in digital geometry processing in this class like basically establishing this f equal to 2v thing so we thank Euler formula for that and we can even stop here very safely but uh, since this is a very elegant formula I have made some additional research on it there are many good videos around and this book I read it partially it is also nice so I have uh, witnessed some other uh, not directly related stuff so I will mention them for about 10 slides uh, so it is not correctly irrelevant because we will after all do some analysis like shape analysis so and this topology formula uh, is still helpful so this theorem a very popular one in math domain is that there are at most five platonic solids so platonic name comes from this philosopher Plato not about love uh, so platonic solid is the one where I have this polyhedron okay so polyhedron means set of polygons okay if every polygon is the same like all of them are triangle and also uh, all the polygons have the same side lengths like all of them are equilateral triangle or in this case the polygon is quad squat um, so no rectangle allowed uh, because I have I want the same si side length etc so these are platonic solids okay uh, so they are very regular structures you can see Pentagon can also be used as a polygon face, but with a hexagon you cannot just cover uh, the polyhedron using the hexa hexagon six sides. And we will prove it uh, with this thing. Don't worry, it is not that messy. Uh, so basically, let n be the number of edges on each face. So it is three if I am using triangles. And let m be the degree of the vertex, in other words, number of edges coming to that vertex, which is also 3 here and 4 here, if you notice. So let's do this analysis. What is f times n? f is number of faces, and since n is the number of edges on it, uh, and by the previous analysis, uh, it counts the number of edges over counts it counts twice the number of edges okay so let me remind this again uh, so for this face I count these three edges and then for this orange face I again count these three edges but be careful this edge has been counted twice so fn is equal to 2e in other words e is equal to this identity similarly f times n counts each vertex not twice but m many times too many times why because uh, for this vertex for this face this vertex is count for this face this vertex is count again and for this uh, face this vertex is count again so not just twice but it is counted 3 m times in this case as m guys are meeting there so I have this V in my hand then comes the Euler formula where I can rewrite this with these equations and I end up with this face number 
And since this is an integer, this denominator cannot be zero and cannot be negative, so it must be positive, uh, which leads me to this inequality, okay? And I also know the following. N must be bigger than or equal to 3 because with two edges I can't cover this region. I can't close that region. I need at least 3, which gives me the atomic polygon, which is triangle, okay? And similarly, M is at these three because I want a closed shape uh, and so if you keep m equal to 2 for instance and take this tetrahedron example so then it means that you have to leave a gap between this face and the others okay because 2 is already covered by these red lines so I need at least 3 okay so what is happening then I can write rewrite this 2n over n minus 2 is bigger than m, so this is coming from that equation, and m is bigger than or equal to 3, which by transition tells me that uh, no, I, I first multiply everything by n minus 2, okay, so 2n is big, uh, bigger than bigger than this 3. I am bypassing this validly and I also multiply it by n minus 2 so I end up with this equation which tells me that n must be less than 6 okay and by symmetry from the same equation you can also conclude this fact so n cannot be 2 as we established when n is 3 what happens is I have 6 is bigger than m times uh, 1 so m must be less than 6 so I can take 3 4 and 5 and in particular this gives me tetrahedron 3 is the degree and 3 is the uh, number of edges on the face okay so but 3 and can be anything so when n is 4 again come back to this equation then it makes 8 bigger than or equal to 2m so m must be less than 4 so I can only select 3 as m and finally when n is 5 this equation becomes 10 is bigger than or equal to 3m so in this case I can only select 3 as my m which gives which gives pentagon right this Thing because it is the only thing with n equal to 5. I have 5 edges on the polygon. Yes, okay, this is one fact. By the way, this was a purely topological proof. It was all about relationship between n and m. It is not uh, proving anything about the side lengths, which is also in the definition, okay, angle lengths, angle amounts. So for that we have this geometric proof which is more involved so I am skipping that but with the current proof I have uh, proved that all platonic, all platonic solids resemble these five guys in topology sense but this is also valid based on that proof. So for the full proof you need to do the geometric proof uh, <coughs> in this Euclid's book. And here is another fact uh, that will use our Euler formula, which basically tells that I have a polyhedron, which is a hybrid one consisting of pentagons and hexagons, like the soccer ball that we like very much. And if the degree of every vertex is 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, etc., then the number of Pentagonal faces, the black faces, will be exactly 12. Okay, so application wise, it has maybe nothing. Yeah, and I am, I have studied this uh, mostly because I like this soccer ball, but still, if you really force it, uh, you can tell that you are manufacturing n soccer balls, then you are, you certainly know that you will have 
12 and pentagonal faces so you can just print that many uh, again it's a fantastic fantasy uh, application but let's still prove it uh, so if P is the number of pentagonal faces, black faces, and H is the number of hexagonal faces, then if I count all the faces by this, I will be counting each H twice, so this will be 2E, with that logic we have seen before. And similarly, each vertex is counted three times, uh, thrice, uh, because the degree is 3, so 3 faces are meeting here. Uh, then just plug them into our v minus e plus f equal to 2 equation and do some basic uh, elementary rewritings and 12 will be your p and by the way uh, so i have just proven proven that uh, we have uh, only five platonic solids so can I have one with all hexagons around where n is equal to 6? No. So golf balls look that way, but upon close inspection, you will see this little pentagon here. Okay, so it is really impossible to cover everywhere with your hexagons. Similarly, carbon atom, we have the hybrid situation, and in the soccer ball, we have the situation going another application of v minus e plus f equal to 2 is this planarity check k5 is a complete graph meaning that with five vertices meaning that i have five vertices and uh, all the possible five choose to equal to 10 uh, pairs are connected by an edge so this is not planar I can prove it, I will prove it, but application-wise, this is interesting, so it is not that uh, fantastic, it's not that fa fantasy application, so assume you are building an electric circuit, uh, and these are your wires, if you know that K5 is not planar, meaning that you must intersect uh, at least two wires at some point so it means that there will be an electrical shortcuts shortcut at this one so you should avoid using <coughs> um, that architecture then maybe you can use another layer to avoid that uh, shortcut so it can be useful that planarity check here <coughs> so how, what is the proof then? Uh, so basically, <coughs> uh, <coughs> if this is a planar graph, then this equation must hold. So 5 is the number of verses v, and number of edges, since it is complete, it is 5 close to 10, uh, and number of faces is going to be 7 by this formula because it is equal to 2. So, now let's do this analysis. <clears throat> In a regular closed triangle mesh like this, we have seen this a lot of times, each edge borders two faces. So every face has exactly three edges. Okay? Uh, uh, which means that 3F, 3 times number of faces, counts each edge twice so this, there is an equality here we have seen this in k5 each edge borders two faces again okay uh, but every face now the face concept here is different sometimes i have triangle sometimes i have a quad face here if you follow my cursor so uh, it is not on it is a hybrid of faces so then this 3f count will not be able to reach this 2e because the exactly condition is lost. Let me be more clear. So if all the faces have 3 edges, then 3f will give me 2e. But if all the faces still uniform but 4 edges, then 4f will give me 2e. So moral of the story is this 2e identity is... <coughs> 
at least 3f. It is sometimes 4f, sometimes 5f, 5f, but it is at least 3f. So I have this 3f less than or equal to 2e thing going on. Then let's plug our f here, which is 21, less than or equal to 2 times 10, which is a contradiction. So k5 cannot be planar then. And so for the electrical circuit example, if you say that, okay, this is just 5 nodes, it's a very small circuit, but still k5 non-planar condition is a very useful information because there is a theorem in graph theory which says that a, a graph, a very big graph, like millions of nodes, anything, it is planar if and only if it doesn't have any k5 in it as a subgraph. Okay, so basically uh, information about K5 or similarly K33 uh, is useful to make decisions about the planarity of big graphs. And my final example will be on this graph coloring application, which is, let me first introduce you the problem and then the application. Problem is you have a graph, you want to color uh, every vertex uh, in such a way that if they are neighbor, they are neighbors, then the colors must be different. So the application can be the following. Every vertex is a coarse and uh, there is an edge if there is a clash between course, meaning that two students, uh, one student is taking both courses at the same semester like this is uh, English and this is calculus and this is algorithms maybe okay so I want to make an exam and I need three different slots three different colors for those three courses obviously I have nine courses in this example so I can reserve nine slots but I want to make it efficiently so graph coloring uh, will give you the lowest number Okay, so in this case, for instance, this was algorithms, right? So there was another course like uh, sports course, gymnastic course. Uh, so this course, no student is taking both of them together. So there is no clash. So I can put them into the same time slot. So I can, the less the time slot, uh, the less the number of proctors I will hire. So uh, cheaper for me. Okay, so this is the graph coloring problem, uh, and it is known that uh, a connected planar graph can be colored with actually four colors. So four is enough, and the proof of it is with computers. And since four is enough, obviously five is enough, and that proof is purely mathematical, but a little bit harder. So I will just prove you that six color is also enough. So how do I do it? Uh, obviously, if the graph has six or less colors, I can just put my available six colors and I can color it without any problem. Uh, but for the general case, take this graph and every connected planar graph contains a vertex of degree five or less. Okay, so I will prove it in the next slide with the Euler's formula. But currently, let's believe me. So remove that vertex, okay, and I have this subgraph, which is a smaller case where the induction hypothesis holds for sure. So I can color this subgraph with uh, six colors or less, okay. So assume that uh, in this case, all those colors have been different on the neighbors. So when I put the V back, I can use the sixth color because this guy was connected to five or less guys, not six guys. Okay, so I can use the purple color here. Or in another scenario, this is blue. This can also this could have been blue as well, right? Because there is no connection here and that graph algorithm coloring algorithm could put blue here as well. Uh, so if this is blue, blue, orange, yellow, green, then I am using four colors, so I can use fifth or sixth color here. So in any case, I can do the sixth coloring easily. But to uh, to believe that, you need to 
understand that there is this wonderful vertex of degree 5 or less in any planar connected graph like this graph take this one uh, <clears throat> just make it all face make all faces triangular okay so this face is currently four sided make it two three sided like here but the infinite face around isn't uh, fitting the definition because it is stuck into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven edges currently. Uh, so also make it work like with that thing. I have one, two, three sided uh, face. I have one, two, three sided face. Similarly, one, two, three sided face. So you construct this enlarged graph. And now notice that the infinite face outer side here is going to hit one this big arc two and three so it is also valid for the exterior face anyway so now this is the smart observation so I know that if the uh, so this vertex has a degree of four right it is five or less so this is the one I am looking for maybe and in this construction it still exists actually I am doing something worse so I am adding edges so here if I can prove that uh, if I can prove that this enlarged graph has a vertex of degree 5 or less then that thing must also exist here okay because I am just adding edges here so it will be uh, it will have a degree of more than necessary okay and still in this condition I have a degree with 5 or less then that vertex will certainly be here with a degree of 5 or less okay this is the observation so then but this is a very regular graph so I can do this analysis clearly basically uh, I have triangular mesh so I have 3f equal to 2e satisfying uh, as we discussed in the mesh statistics slide then use the Euler's formula which will give you this equality and just multiply both sides by 6 and I end up with this 6e minus 6f where 6e what's happening where 6 V minus 2 is okay okay instead of 6f I will put 4e here so 6e minus 4e is 2e okay so I have this equality in my hand but wait a second I will do one more step uh, sum of all degrees is 2e actually we have established that right again in the previous slide because when you take the degree of this vertex it will be 2 okay uh, but then when you take the degree of this vertex you count this edge again okay so sum of all the uh, degrees will be 2e okay so the average degree is then going to be equal to 2e minus v which is equal to uh, 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 6v minus 12 uh, uh, okay so 2 is equal to this equality so I will just go and get that from here and to get the average degree I will divide it by v so I end up with this value as my average degree okay 16 minus something minus something non-zero thing so it is less than 6 then comes the logic uh, if average degree is less than 6 then there must be at least one vertex with a degree of 5 or less to, to decrease this average to below 6 okay and here uh, by the way so far I didn't want to confuse you a lot I have considered uh, this type of topology where the number of handles or the genus is 0 but you can use the Euler formula in general with any genus all you have to do is to add this term to our formula 
so when Janus is zero it is going to be two anyway uh, and so let's come back to digital geometry processing before leaving this first class and from now on the following classes uh, will not be this math involved uh, actually so uh, so these are some cool videos that may keep you motivated get you motivated so they are some of them are very old but they are still gold like for instance maybe if I click here uh, this is from 2006 and worked over 1 million times so it's also well, small. popular uh, so basically what they do here is they analyze the shape collection by geometry processing like shape correspondence and statistical analysis etc so they learn the shape space and then using learned parameters they can create new shapes on this space for instance okay so there are many examples like this uh, you should go over them so uh, and this will be the end of this class uh, all right goodbye